Hello all, in this video we are going to see about certain high yield topics which are useful in medical education technology or we commonly call it as pedagogic practices. Now firstly the domains of learning. There are three common domains of learning that is cognitive domain, affective domain and psychomotor domain. Newly communication is also considered as a domain. Basically cognition deals with the brain, affective deals with the heart and psychomotor deals with the hands that is performing an action when it comes to the modes of the learning the cognition domain is focused on thoughts or thinking affective domain is based on emotions or feeling psychomotor domain is based on actions or doing or performing so the abilities should be able to memorize understand and reasoning all comes under cognition the ability such as appreciation motivation comes under affective domain typing playing performing an experiment all comes under psychomotor domain so these three are the common domains of learning and communication can also be considered as the fourth domain of learning. Bloom's taxonomy for level of learning that is again divided into three types based on the domains. So this is a pyramid where base stands at the remembering facts. So it is recalling the facts and basic concepts, the ability to def define concepts, duplicate or repeat what is in the subject and list out, memorize, repeat, state the concepts comes under the base of this Bloom's taxonomy. Me. Whereas understanding the concepts, that is the ability to explain ideas or concepts such as classifying, describing, discussing, explaining, identifying, locating, recognizing, reporting, selecting, translating, all comes under this level of learning of cognitive domain under Bloom's taxonomy. When we move, we reach this phase of the pyramid that is up applying the cognitive facts, that is use of information in new situations for execution, implementation, solving and these purposes. As we claim one step above, we reach the analyzing phase where we draw connections among the ideas and the concepts present. So we differentiate, organize, relate, compare, contrast between the concepts. And as we climb above this pyramid, we reach evaluation stage where we justify a stand or decision, where we critically appraise, argue, defend, judge, select, support, value, critique, weigh the existing knowledge. As we climb up, we reach the top of the pyramid that is creating a new knowledge knowledge or the cognitive domain. We produce new or original work where we design, assemble, construct, develop, formulate, author or investigate. That is the topmost place of this pyramid that is creation according to the Bloom's taxonomy. The same Bloom's taxonomy for affective domain is here. So the base is formed by receiving or attending learner will be willing to be aware of the setting or situation, gives attention by choice. They are open to the experience. Then the next stage as we ascend in this ladder we reach responding where the learners willingly participate and they will be obedient volunteers find satisfaction in participating and they are ready to respond as we move to the next step we reach this valuing where we are motivated to invest chooses to behave in a certain way frequently begins to identify with the behavior and to commit it and as we climb further we reach this organizing that is values become systematic we can come Compare and contrast values and choices, begins to order and prioritize values, chooses to commit to certain values and behavior. Then finally, we reach the top of this attitude domain of learning that is characterizing. What we called as creating in the cognitive domain is called as characterizing in affective domain. It is just acting consistently due to an internal belief which can articulate a philosophy or worldview. It can break down complex situations and respond accordingly based on values values which develops and lives by a code of personal behavior. So this stage is called as characterizing under affective domain of learning which is the tip of this pyramid for affective domain of learning. Next is for the psychomotor domain. This is called as Simpson psychomotor domain where the base of the pyramid is formed by the perception. This is for the psychomotor domain. The learner will be able to distinguish, describes, identifies, isolates, relates certain tasks or the psychomotor aspects of the computer. Competencies. As we move up the ladder, we reach a stage called set where we display or explain the procedures and volunteers to the procedure. And we move up this pyramid, we reach the guided response where we can be able to copy or discover or duplicate the procedures. Then we ascend above, we reach a stage called mechanism where we adjust, build or try to illustrate or we can try to manipulate, mix and set up new things at this stage. 
then we reach the next stage called the complex overt response where we try to assemble builds calibrates constructs dismantles and again displays so all this so this stage is called as complex overt stage then the next stage will be the adaptation stage where we can adapt the same psychomotor skill into our own settings change according to our need build develop and supply at this stage this is called as adaptation and finally the tip of this pyramid of psychomotor domain is the origination what we called as create in cognitive domain and characterizing in affective domain is called as origination in psychomotor domain where we construct design create and produce the skills or the set of procedures so that is called as simpson psychomotor domain for level of learning next we move on to the differences between curriculum and syllabus curriculum is a set of courses or coursework and their content offered at an educational in institution whereas the syllabus is a descriptive list of subjects that are to be taught in the class the curriculum contains course content objectives and methodologies whereas the syllabus contains just the list of topics to cover and details about their assignments and assessments so the basic purpose for this curriculum is to define the content plan and methodology of the whole study program or course whereas the syllabus is to define specific instructions activities and scheduling for a particular subject the scope of the curriculum is always wide whereas the scope of syllabus is very narrow the curriculum is always prescriptive which comes from above whereas syllabus is always descriptive which is based on the needs of the students decided by the local authorities curriculum is usually created by government or universities higher management whereas syllabus is created by subject professor this curriculum stays for a longer time period whereas syllabus stays until the specific subject term is finished when it comes to the flexibility almost the there is no place for alterations or change in the curriculum whereas syllabus can be highly flexible so that it can be changed as per the needs of the students lastly the availability for the students the curriculum can be available by the request of the students whereas syllabus will be by default always available to the students syllabus is always located within the curriculum and within this syllabus lies the teaching program next we move on to the differences between pedagogy and andragogy as the name indicates pedagogy is for teaching children and andragogy is for teaching adults but the basic difference when it comes to the learner aspect is pedagogy the learner is dependent upon the instructor for everything so it is instructor centered for all learning whereas the andragogy is self directed the teacher or instructor assumes full responsibility for what is taught and how it is learned the learner is responsible for his or her own learning the teacher or instructor evaluates the learning again here self evaluation is characteristic so pedagogy is instructor centered and andragogy is is learner centered when it comes to the role of learner's experience in pedagogy the learner comes to the activity with little experience that could be tapped as a resource for learning whereas in andragogy the learner brings a greater volume and quantity of experience the experience of the instructor is most influential in pedagogy whereas in andragogy adults are a rich resource for one another different exposures assure diversity in group of adults experience become the source of self identity in andragogy when it comes to the readiness to learn between pedagogy and andragogy pedagogy students are told what they have to learn in order to advance to the next level of mastery whereas in andragogy any change is likely to trigger a readiness to learn ability to assess the gaps between where one is now and where one wants and need to be is understood by the adult learner so the gaps in the knowledge is self understood and they will be ready to learn the gaps in andragogy whereas the next level of mastery it will be decided by the instructor in pedagogy when it comes to the orientation and motivation between the pedagogy and andragogy in pedagogy learning is a process of acquiring prescribed subject matter whereas in andragogy learners want to perform a task solve a problem live in a more satisfying way here in pedagogy content units are sequenced according to the logic of the subject matter whereas here learning must have relevance to real life task learning is organized around life work situations rather than the subject unit or matters in pedagogy it is primarily motivated by the external pressures competitions for grades and consequences of failure whereas in andragogy there will be internal motivators such as self esteem recognition better quality of 
life self confidence and self actualization so that is the basic difference between pedagogy and andragogy at this juncture i want to introduce a new term called as pedagogy it is a form of self determined learning by an autonomous learner with practices and principles rooted in andragogy where the learner chooses what is to be learned and even how they would like to learn it that can be determined by pedagogy so basically if we consider this pedagogy as level 1 where we have engagement with learning and andragogy as level 2 where we have cultivation of self directed learning and in this pyramid the tip level 3 is the pedagogy where realization of self determined learning so here the learner maturity and autonomy needs to be higher to climb this pyramid up whereas the instructor control and course structure will be higher as we move down this pyramid as a continuum of andragogy pedagogy is a stage where andragogy is self directed pedagogy is self determined it is a single loop learning it is a double loop learning it is for developing a competency it is for developing a capability it has a linear design and learning approach it has a non linear design and learning approach instructor learner directed learning here learner directed learning here the students have the content to learn here the students need to understand how they are going to learn that is it is process oriented now here are some pedagogy glimpses what is mean by set induction set induction is the initial instructional act by a teacher for the purpose of establishing a frame of reference between the people and the desired behavioral objectives of the learning experience it is the process of gaining people attention at the beginning of the class there are various methods for this set induction you can set up links from the previous class you can draw attention of the audience and create interest by giving examples experiences illustrating examples such as stories and the recent news etc you can put up the previous questions to create interest in this topic and you can display videos and tell stories for set induction now why set induction is needed we need to gain the attention of the learners we need to motivate the learners and gain the interest of the audience make the students focused into the right frame introduce to a new concept for that we need set induction then the most common question is what is lighthouse effect the teacher will have a vision across the audience which will facilitate an eye to eye contact with the audience and helps in engaging them and they will have feeling of belongingness the teacher will be scanning the entire audience like a lighthouse without concentrating on one part of the audience so this is called as lighthouse effect now what is mean by fillers fillers are also known as pausing or hesitation phenomena which are commonly occurring feature of natural speech in which gaps or hesitations appear during the production of utterances these are silent pauses a silent break between the words and filled pauses which are gaps filled by such expressions as mm, rr, mm. fillers can be fillers sound fillers faces fillers words if you carefully notice the very older presentations of mine the presentations will be fully occupied with this filler sound such as mm, uh, these two will be my own common filler sounds more than 90% of the fillers has been reduced consciously over years by me but the rest 10 percentage has taken the editing cut so now my current presentations will be free of this filler sounds and this need not be a sound sometimes people use phrases to match up this filler sound they'll use i think that you know what i'm trying to say is all these are all phrases which are commonly used as fillers and sometimes they use fillers word also most commonly people use these words as the fillers basically these will be unnecessary usage and remember the usage of this fillers will not be annoying when you are presenting in front of a direct audience but when you are making a presentation recording and video for a online audience then this fillers matters a lot people used to notice for that you need to consciously reduce and you need to use editing softwares to remove those filler sounds now what is mean by hidden curriculum a hidden curriculum is a set of lessons which are learned but not openly intended to be taught in the school this hidden curriculum can be in norms values beliefs conveyed in both classroom and also the social environment develop this hidden curriculum among the students it can be a social skill usually this hidden curriculum is not explicitly taught it is learned through observations it is a kind of informal 
learning unwritten and unintended lessons will be there beyond the formal curriculum so hidden curriculum may be a knowledge or a skill but more importantly it can be a attitude or belief the hidden or unofficial curriculum is determined by educational environment and relates to the students experience if the planned curriculum is this the delivered curriculum in institutions will be this but the learned curriculum of the students will be this so this part is the planned curriculum and this part is the delivered curriculum here this is the hidden curriculum which the student acquires from the schools informally or unofficially so most of the learning by the students are by this hidden curriculum only now we move on to the education spiral education it is a process to bring about desirable changes in the behavior of the learner in the form of acquisition of knowledge proficiency skills and development of attitudes the three main components of education spiral educational objectives will be the first component and from which we plan for teaching and learning activities and from which we evaluate the students and we focus on the same objective or we move on to the new objectives and again this cycle continues and this is not unidirectional that's why it is called as education spiral and all this level you need to have a proper planning for this execution of educational spiral next we move on to the spices model of educational strategies this spices model of educational strategies is insisted in the new cbme based medical education curriculum if this is the spectrum or continuum of one end that is teacher centered and student centered in spices model we should focus on the educational strategies to be student centered and again if one end is the inf information gathering we should move from the information gathering and reach a state of problem based learning we should move from discipline based learning to integrated learning we should move from hospital based learning to community based learning we should move from standard program to electives program learning we should move from apprenticeship based op or opportunistic learning to systematic learning so this is called as spices learning where student centered problem based integrated community based electives systematic learning approach is there for learning strategies next is the sandwich feedback technique when we provide feedback there should be always a positive comment first then the constructive feedback in the middle and the closing statement should be reaffirming with the positive comment so this kind of sandwich feedback technique will deliver our feedback better what is fair principles of effective learning fair stands for feedback activity individualization relevance we need to give feedback to students as they progress to mastery of the expected learning outcomes activity we need to engage the student in active rather than passive learning individualization we need to relate the learning to the needs of the individual student and relevance we need to make the learning relevant to the students in terms of their career objectives then what is phog approach of teaching decisions this is the old traditional decision making by the teachers that is phog model where most of the times teachers take decisions from prejudices hunches opinions and guesses so prejudices means the previous judgments and hunches means based on their experiences how it works and opinions is the personal opinions of the teachers and guesses is the probability what the teacher feels about how things work so that is the old traditional phog model of teaching decisions next is the kirkpatrick's model for levels of learning so in this model the first stage is the reaction where we need to measure our participants initial reaction to gain an understanding of the training program and valuable insights into material quality educator and more then we move on to the learning where we measure how much information was effectively observed during the training and map it to the program or individual learning objectives we move on to the next stage the behavior where they measure how much your training has influenced the behavior of the participants that is in day to day practices how much they are applying your concepts you need to evaluate how they apply this information on their job then finally the results and while applying how successful they are that is this results so we need to measure and analyze the impact of your training has had at the business level and we need to be sure to tie it to the individual or program next is the dunde three circle outcome model this is the foundation for a competent and reflective practitioner where we have three circles in it the first circle is doing the right thing the second circle is doing the thing right the third circle is the right person doing it so this dunde three 
circle outcome model explains the right person doing the right thing right for this to occur we need to work on certain parameters such as doing the right thing we need to work on these parameters doing the thing right we need to work on these parameters and the right person doing it we need to work on these parameters so that is the dandy three circle outcome model then we have the curriculum spiral this was proposed by american psychologist and cognitive theorist jerome brunner where relevant to the concept of sequencing the recent cbme based medical education focused on integration and alignment this has made the sequencing of the topics into a big question which is almost neglected or killed in this cbme based guidelines in this curriculum spiral during the phase 1 the student will be having a normal structure function and behavior then when they try adopting to become a doctor they will develop an abnormal structure function and behavior in further phases when they get exposed to the clinical practice and on the job training lead them to a person with good cognition attitude and skills this is called as curriculum spiral relevant to the concept of sequencing is the idea of spiral curriculum where there is an iterative revisiting of topics subjects or themes more effective learning can result when the learning content is presented in smaller chunks and these are revisited later rather than when the content is presented in one larger chunk learning over time otherwise called as spaced learning occurs for example when the cardiovascular system is considered in phase 1 of the curriculum and revisited again in phase 2 and phase 3 this helps to ensure that the information and understanding gained is not degraded a spiral curriculum is not simply the repetition of the topic thought it requires the depending of understanding with each successive encounter building on the previous one so the futures of this spiral curriculum are the topics will be revisited there are increasing levels of difficulty new learning is related to previous learning there are four dimensions which needs to be considered that is increased breadth increased difficulty increased utility and application to practice and increased proficiency so the spiral curriculum proposed by brenner is an educational approach key concepts are revisited at inter- levels throughout a student's education with each encounter increasing in complexity and building upon prior knowledge this repetitive reinforcement ensures deeper understanding and retention of the subject matter over time the key principles are it will be cyclical that is the students return to the same topic several times increasing depth each time the topic should be learned at the deeper level and the prior knowledge should be used when returning to the topic to build the students foundations next is the curriculum mapping curriculum map- mapping is a process of aligning resources activities instructions assessments and educational reforms within a program it is referred to as diagramming or indexing a curriculum to rectify the redundancies gaps and misalignments in the course content it presents the curriculum as a sophisticated blend of educational strategies course content learning outcomes educational experiences assessment and program of courses basically it provides information about what is taught how it is taught when it is taught where it is taught and how learning is assessed that is called as curriculum mapping c stands for various abbreviations c stands for curriculum planning curriculum implementation and curriculum evaluation c stands for competency based education communicating about the curriculum continuum of education across undergraduate postgraduate and continuing education collaboration with all of the stakeholders including the other healthcare professions changes in the learning outcomes and the educational program we move on to the miller's prism of clinical competence where we have the domains arranged as the second dimension in this pyramid that is knowledge skills and attitude but the basic dimension of this prism is knows knows how shows and does in knows there will be fact gathering in knows how there will be interpretation or application through case presentations essays extended matching type mcqs and knows can be assessed using traditional true or false or mcq type of assessment shows that is in this stage they have the competence of demonstration of learning this can be assessed via simulations and askies and thus where the performance is integrated into practice this can be assessed using direct observation work placed based assessment so at the end of the base of this miller's prism of clinical competence is noways and through professional authenticity he becomes an expert when he reaches the tip of this prism next is the curriculum cube curriculum cube has three sides that is the learning out comes the learning opportunities and clinical presentation and tasks a curriculum is much more than the collection of topics 
to be studied or a syllabus to be followed. RAG described cubic curriculum, three curriculum dimensions that is subject matter, cross curricular themes and issues and the different methods of teaching and learning. These three dimensions made this curriculum cube. In medical education, this translate into three dimensions of learning outcomes or competencies, clinical presentations and tasks, the courses and learning opportunities that can be a lecture or problem based learning session. Now what is SIP approach for evaluation? SIP approach aims to provide an analytic and rational basis for program decision making and it is based on cycle of planning, structuring, implementing and reviewing and revising decisions each examined through a different aspect of evaluation such as context, input, process and product evaluation. So SIP means C stands for context, I stands for input, P stands for process and another P stands for product evaluation. So this is the SIP evaluation model where context, input, process and product will be evaluated. Under context, we evaluate the goals. Under input, we evaluate the plans. Under process, we evaluate the actions. Under product, we evaluate the outcomes. So these are the individual parameters under this SIP evaluation model. Now we move on to the flipped classroom. The term flipped classroom was used in 2007 by chemistry teachers Jonathan Bergman and Aram Sams. They proposed that in the flipped classroom, students watch recorded lectures for homework and then they come back and engage in further work and discussions in the class with their teacher. So the difference between the flipped classroom approach and the traditional classroom approach is in traditional classroom, the student acquire facts in a lecture and following a lecture, students work individually or in a group to explore the topic and apply the information which are learned to their practice. Whereas in this flipped classroom approach, students work individually or in small groups and they acquire the facts first. Then they come into a lecture setting where the students explore the topic along with the teacher and this type of learning is called as flipped classroom approach. So the advantages of this flipped classroom approach, students take ownership of their learning. Learning is personalized to the needs of the individual student. Students can work at pace and place to suit them according to their preferred learning style. Learning takes the center stage and students get the multiple opportunities in the large group sessions that follow the preparatory work to demonstrate their understanding of their topic. Students receive important feedback and areas of difficulty can be identified with remediation provided as necessary. The approach provides teachers with opportunity to engage with the students and to get a greater buzz from their face-to-face -face teaching. The disadvantages with this flipped classroom is students must be disciplined to study the topic using the resources recommended prior to attending the whole class sessions. The preparation of the learning resource material to an accepted standard takes time and some teachers may be concerned about criticism from their peers when the materials is made available. The program for the whole class session requires careful planning and teacher may feel uncomfortable with the level of uncertainty. We move on to the crisis framework for the effective learning. C stands for convenience that makes voluntary participation easy. R stands for relevance which reflects the user's day-to-day -day role in medical practice. I stands for individualization which allows learners a say in what is learnt and adapt from the program to their own needs. S stands for self-assessment which encourages doctors to evaluate their understanding of the subject and to fill any gaps identified. I stands for interest which arouses attention and encourages learners to participate in the program and S stands for systematic. The learning should offer a planned program with coverage of a whole subject or an identified part of it. So crisis framework is for effective learning. So it should be convenient relevant, individualized, self-assessed, it should create interest and it should be systematic. Then the last on the list is the multi-source feedback MSF or 360 degree evaluation of students or doctors performance. So here the evidence is collected systematically from number of individuals who are in legitimate position to make a judgment about the doctors or students performance. The individuals may be senior or junior colleagues, other members of the healthcare team, administrators, patients or subjects or students. Students. In this way, different perspectives are, are brought to bear on an evaluation of a doctor. Each individual is asked to complete a structured questionnaire relating to the doctor's performance. A rating scale of 1 to 5 or 1 to 7 can be used and comments also will be recorded. And based on this comprehensive structured questionnaire which is distributed among the healthcare team, administrators, patients, students and their colleagues, the multi-system feedback MSF or the 360 degree evaluation of doctors or students work.
works with this we complete the first part of high yield topics of concepts in pedagogy or medical education and if you feel some of the important topics have been missed please post it as a comment i can compile those comments and i can include that in the part 2 hopefully this presentation was useful to you if you like this video please click on the like button and share it to your friends thanks again for watching this video